Lawrence Garvey is fascinated by extreme environments and the mysteries they hold. From the distant reaches of outer space to the Sonoran Desert, the ASU mineralogist finds that such places provide endless opportunities for discovery. It's all dictated by minerals, where they are, how they form, what their structures are, how do we determine their structures, for instance. So whether they're minerals from meteorites, um, or they're minerals formed on the surface of rocks where uh, lichens are growing, for instance. It's all mineralogy. And from that, we have to, you know, we have a variety of techniques that we have to use to study those minerals. In a subterranean lab on campus, Garvey uses powerful tools, such as a scanning electron microscope, to probe the origins of our world. What meteorites really are, are, are fossils. They're, they're four and a half billion year old fossils from the early solar system. So by studying these components, we're trying to decipher what were conditions like during the early, early part of our solar system. There are a variety of materials found in meteorites, but it is the carbon-based components that are of particular interest to Garvey. There's such a wealth of organic compounds in these meteorites. So a lot of the organic building blocks that we see for life on Earth, we find in these meteorites. Now we know these meteorites are falling to Earth, especially during the early part of the solar system when the, when the planets were forming. Our Earth was being bombarded with organic rich meteorites. So in what way did they play a role in, in the origin of life? That's where the real questions are. Anything you see on Earth had to have come from the materials that are in meteorites, including us. We, you know, we are formed of star stuff, as I think Carl Sagan liked to, liked to say. So you're not only understanding the formation and evolution of the rocks that we're sitting on, but you're understanding life itself. Housed within the same building as Garvey's microscope is the ASU Center for Meteorite Studies. It is the largest collection of its kind at any American university, and an abundant source of mysteries still waiting to be solved. The frontiers of exploration of meteorites and I mean any scientific field really have just been pushed further and further over the last several decades by just how small a sample you can look at. So the kind of study that that Lawrence is doing relies on pushing the pushing the boundaries of just how small can you go and just how small a sample can you interrogate to find something meaningful about it. And it's necessary because we have tons and tons of, of meteorites in our collection, but they're very complex at a very microscopic level, and you have to be able to fully unravel the stories that are in meteorites. You have to be able to look at that fundamentally microscopic level. But the examination of some materials called carbonaceous nanoglobules, or as Garvey refers to them, space globules, is not without interesting challenges. It turns out that these things are, since they're so hydrogen rich, they're actually very sensitive, so they change when we, when we look at them too long. You know, just by looking at them in the electron microscope, for instance, you see them shrink. They're losing the hydrogen under the electron beam, for instance. So probably the next and most difficult thing that we're going to do is their structure. In addition to what has fallen to Earth, there are many homegrown discoveries to be made as well. For Garvey, an avid hiker, even a familiar fixture of the desert can reveal the unexpected. So I was hiking out in the desert and I kept coming across fallen saguaros. The woody ribs can last for many years on the desert surface. But what really intrigued me was the fact that there were these large patches and large lumps of tan colored material that, was, that occurred within the ribs and lying around the saguaro as well. So I collected several pieces, um, did a, used a technique called powder x-ray diffraction to identify the minerals that were present. And I was absolutely astonished to come across a number of minerals that we just do not normally find in, the, in a desert environment. The unusual minerals that Garvey identified included such exotic sounding substances as nesquahonite and monohydrocalcite, which tend to decompose in sunlight. He also discovered surprising amounts of something else. I took a slice of a fallen saguaro, dissolved out all, this, all the saguaro flesh, and was, and was left with a big bucket of white, what looked like white sand, which turned out to be calcium oxalate. The, the actual mineral name was wedolite. And then I went back to the desert and saw that as all the organic matter decomposes, the calcium oxalate is concentrated and is left on the desert floor. A large saguaro can contain on the order of 100 kilograms. So imagine wherever you see a saguaro, a several hundred pound bag of calcium oxalate sitting there.
In humans, calcium oxalate can result in kidney stones. In the desert, it transforms into the unusual minerals that Garvey first discovered. It was a wonderful and very unusual uh, environment for minerals to grow. And we were able to find minerals that, some of which are new to science, which I'm in the process of describing. In the course of his desert treks, Garvey literally leaves few stones unturned. On one particular outing, he spied a very unusual organism. So a few years ago, as we were hiking with, with one of my colleagues, we came across quite an unusual lichen. This turned out to be an endolithic lichen, a lichen that was living inside the rock. And all we saw on the surface is what is called the fruiting body of the lichen, the part of the lichen that actually releases the spores into the environment. And this turned out to be a fantastic study because it allowed us to see how a particular species could adapt to the harsh environment that we have around here. How does it live and grow in a rock? There is the scientific question. And then as one, we like to then speculate, well then, if, if organisms that we see on Earth could live in such an unusual environment, just maybe they could live in other uh, extraterrestrial environments as well. Whether studying rocks from space or enigmas found in the desert close to home, Garvey continues to find a common thread in all of his inquiries. There are new discoveries to be made around us at any time. All aspects of the desert involve, in one, one way or another, mineralogy. What's, what's happening to the minerals? What are the minerals that are being broken down? What are they transforming into? So much is going on out here that we don't understand.